Hi class, the last little bit of um, lecture, I'm gonna lecture on this unit is um, talking about acetylcholine and epinephrine, norepinephrine and its control on opening your airway. So when you're opening your airway, you wanna say bronchodilation, open the airway, increase ex air exchange. When you wanna say closing the airway, you wanna say bronchoconstriction and decreasing air exchange. So this is happens depending on what you need. If you're active, you need more air. And when you need more air, you want to turn on the sympathetic nervous system and release epinephrine nor epinephrine, which allows you to bronchodilate, opening the airway. And that gives you more air. And in parasympathetic activation, what happens? You have acetylcholine, ACH, coming in here and that's gonna cause bronchial constriction, okay? Um, this is kind of important in the sense that it is some of the most common medications used to open the airway. So let's talk about some of the pathologies in airway constriction and what kind of medication you will need. First thing I'm gonna talk about is asthma. Uh, Arizona is a high asthma state, so, um, what happens in asthmatic airway is that we have a lot of pollen and pollution and dust and allergens and irritants. And, and that enters the airway, causing the airway to be inflamed and irritated. Think about hives. It's like having a hive on your airway. So that closes the airway. Now, compared to normal, this is much more constricted. So you hear often hear people saying that they have asthma and they're wheezing, they're having that. So they're dragging air into their uh, constricted airway. This, most patients can still get enough air in so that um, they're able to still get air into the alveolar sac and get into the cells. However, doing an asthmatic attack, the inflammation is just more great. Maybe the allergen is really bad that year. Maybe they were smoke. Maybe the patient also had a cold. And, and there's just a lot of mucus also in the airway. So imagine the airway is toast, tiny now and there's mucus surrounding it. So air cannot get through. So this is called an asthma attack. And when that happens, the air is um, unable to pass through and that causes um, a complete blockage of the airway. In the alveolar sac, the air in here is trapped. The CO2 is trapped and cannot get out, okay? Um, so that becomes life-threatening, and that's why they show up in the ER, and you need to find ways to open the airway. And the ways to open the airway are using what we just learned, which is um, um, using an inhaler or breathing treatment. And those breathing treatment, there are usually three things you can get. One is called beta acnes, and that is epinephrine nor epinephrine. So remember what it does, increase the sympathetic effect, and open the airway. Okay, so go back to that slide and remember the sympathetic effect. And you can also use anticholinergic, which means you're blocking the parasympathetic effect, you're anticholinergic, blocking that effect, preventing um, the bronchoconstriction and mucus secretion. And lastly, you can use corticosteroids to decrease inflammation, and that's one of the main causes of um, the asthmatic airway. So these three medications are very commonly used, as, used in breathing treatments and inhaler to make sure that the patient is properly getting air in, but also getting the trapped air out. Okay, remember CO2 gets trapped, so they need to get the CO2 out. And same thing happens in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and the classic COPD is emphysema. Okay, so in emphysema, what happens is 90% of emphysema is caused by smoking. It could be caused by pollution and other things, but what happens is the airway gets so damaged that the bronchial, integrity of the bronchial tube is no longer there, so it collapses. Well, if the tube collapses, air cannot get out. So you can see it here that the air cannot get in or out. Also, what you see is that normally the alveolar sac is having really great air exchange and air is going in and out, in and out. Well, in the case of um, um, COPD emphysema, the alveolar sac is so damaged from smoking, they lose elasticity. So think about rubber band. Let me use this hair tie <laughs> as a rubber band. So when you have a really elastic um, 
um, alveolar sac, when you pull it, it should bounce right back. Pull it, bounce right back. So you have have seen like old rubber bands, right? When you pull on it, it just shreds and doesn't bounce back. Well, that's what it's like. When you have old rubber band, you pull it, it doesn't bounce back, it falls apart. And that will be an emphysema. So this idea of the rubber band bouncing back, recoiling, is really important for inhalation and exhalation. Okay, so you inhale air, you expand the rubber band, you recoil to allow the air to squeeze out. Um, so that becomes a really important thing to get rid of that uh, CO2, okay? So in people, patients with emphysema, that's no longer happening. It doesn't recoil. So you can say right here that it decreased recoil. And when it does that, then the air gets trapped, causing an increase in PCO2. Okay? Um, the treatment for emphysema in the beginning are very similar. You're going to have, we only have this kind of three medications sort of in place where you're going to try to open the airway, decrease inflammation, um, decrease the parasympathetic effect by increasing the sympathetic effect of bronchodilation. Okay, and chronic bronchitis is just, it's like an airway that's almost always um, like asthma. Asthma have triggers. Chronic uh, bronchitis does not. It's, it's just damaged. So damage causes the extra inflammation and the extra lupus. And um, the last pathology we kind of talk about is pneumonia. Pneumonia is when the airway is so, uh, it's a form of infection like a bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia. And then the airway gets so inflamed that extra mucus starts seeping in. And also the mucociliary escalator is not bringing that mucus up. So the mucus starts sinking down, um, causing the alveolar sac to be filled with mucus and bacteria starts populating or uh, uh, just fluid populating in that area causing the air sac to be saturated with mucus, and that's, not, that's gonna not be a functional alveolar space anymore. If there's lots of mucus here, you're not able to gas exchange like in a normal one, okay? Uh, pneumonia is a common thing uh, that you wanna watch out for in the hospital. A lot of disease actually end up, one of the, uh, that take patient's life is actually pneumonia. So if you think about patients with, um, uh, congestive heart failure and pneumonia might be the final uh, problem, okay? So um, treatment of pneumonia is really important. And speaking of pneumonia and the treatment of pneumonia, since COVID-19 is in the news, uh, I brought COVID-19, just so you know, you're gonna have just a question or so on this. You don't need to know the huge amount of detail, but I wanna show you how COVID-19 infects. So COVID-19 is a virus, and the virus enters the nose and the airway from just breathing. You can watch a little, nice little animation about it right here. And once it infects the airway, again, normal airway should look like this, but if bacteria virus got brought into the airway, this is the COVID-19 virus, or SARS-CoV-2 structure, it infects the air, um, the pa air passageway, but also the alveolar cells, okay? And when they infect the alveolar cells, the alveolar cells um, will, re will call on the immune system to help it. And between the infection and the immune response, a fluid starts accumulating in the alveolar sac. So here you can see this is a moderate case. This patient might be at home and trying to heal, but doesn't have very severe pneumonia. It could become very severe depending on the patient or if, if they already have a pre-existing condition and, they're, they're, and there's an issue already, then the mucus becomes so severe that this alveolar sac really becomes useless. So if this is happening to a majority part of the lung, that's gonna cause a lot of problems. So here's an x-ray of a patient. Right in the beginning of infection, you can see some airway that is being saturated with mucus from the infection. And as it progresses um, a day later, uh, it's now more of the lung. And now a day later, it is the entire lung is almost has a lot of mucus. So in this case, that lung is lost function. So maybe it's down to 20% function. Well, that's not enough to bring the air in to the patient. So that's when the ventilators are needed to help that patient breathe. And hopefully through the ventilator and the body, the body's able to recover from the disease. So there's a lot of, in the news of a COVID-19 infection, why you want to not 
and have the exposure of the virus. So if the virus doesn't come into your alveolar cells, obviously you don't have an infection. So uh, washing your hands, don't put your uh, hands on your face, inhale the virus, covering your face, um, things like that can prevent um, infection. And once a patient is infected, they definitely should stay home and try to recover. And if they're having breathing distress, then they should go to the hospital. And that's the, why there's a lot of talk about if there's not enough ventilators, then who is going to get the ventilator, okay? Um, so I just thought that I'd bring that up because um, you know that the healthcare workers are in the front line of this. And I have so many students who's actually working in NICU and their stories are very humbling. And I hope that you see that your role in the society is a great role and that you are empowered to become that profession and become their frontline uh, support in the fight for health and wellness. Okay, um, that's uh, the whole respiratory system. And this is this week's module. And I'll um, post uh, acid base soon. So it's gonna be a rolling thing. So we're gonna do respiratory first and I'm gonna post acid base and then there's urinary and that concludes on unit four. Okay, we're almost there, so keep going.